Okay, uh, welcome along. I am Dr. Nicole Gruel, a Spiritual Awakening International Advisory Board member, and I am thrilled to be with you for this final session of this amazing, incredible gathering of extraordinary people. Hasn't this been amazing? Have you just been having a super time? Um, share some love in the chat if you have been, and you can put in your favourite parts as well and let people know how your experience has been. So this is um, the finale piece, the uh, STE Experiences panel. We have four speakers with us, and after that we'll break into a bit of a Q&A. If you would like a question um, shared, I ask that you please keep it short and snappy um, and try and get your questions in early, and that way you'll have the best chance of um, having your question picked up so that we can share it with the speaker at the end. And so with that said, I would love to welcome along our first speaker, Gary L. Wimmer. Tell you a bit about Gary. So in 1977, Gary was involved in a head-on collision with a speeding car. He travelled to dimensions and worlds beyond imagination and that NDE, that near-death experience, changed his life forever. Gary has been a professional medium, healer, teacher, spiritualist and clairvoyant for 45 years. He is the author of the books A Second in Eternity and, very excitingly, Lithomancy, The Psychic Art of Reading Stones. That's very cool. Gary, welcome and please share with us about The Great Awakening. Well, great to be with you folks and thank you, Yvonne, for hosting this and having this. Uh, Nicole, for being our, I guess, our moderator tonight. Uh, yeah, I was very fortunate. Uh, I started getting interested in psychic ability in college, uh, it, it reading a lot of Edgar Casey and so forth. And a, um, actually, a couple of astrologers told me I had a lot of natural psychic ability. As an electrical engineer, I didn't quite grasp it, but the more I started reading about it, uh, the more I realized, wow, I really have always kind of been that way. I grew up with two older brothers watching them feud, and I could always tell what was going to happen, you know. So when I moved to Austin in 1970, um, I started to learn to give them readings a couple of years after that. Uh, in and I was traveling with bands. I was a musician. I've been playing guitar since I was a teenager before the Beatles even came out. So uh, that's how I made a living uh, most of my life. In 1977, I had the most incredible experience anybody could ever have, and I'm eternally grateful for it. Uh, it started out as just I started picking up things but pretty dramatically about what people are going to say. The phone is going to ring. Next day, my roommate walks in reading the paper and I could read it through his eyes. That night we went to a bar and I could feel people walking by. I could tell all about their names and what they were going through and why. I didn't know. I could see people i could imagine myself going outside the bar and standing and seeing people walk in and open up my eyes and i was still on the bar stool and they'd walk in exactly as i'd seen this ability this natural psychic ability that all of us have took off like a rocket and by the second and third day i had no idea what normal life was like anymore i was living in a completely altered world yes i was scared but i was also feeling extremely lightened. It was the, it was a strangest tightrope of reality I, I could have, I've ever been on. This escalated and escalated and escalated. And during this period, I kept feeling like I was being watched or monitored better yet. And I felt like these guardian angels who I didn't see, but I could feel around me. They were kind of checking in on me once in a while because I thought I was going crazy. I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea why. I didn't know if there was an off button but I was freaking out my friends, my roommates. And the only thing that gave me some consolation sometimes was realizing I did feel these monitors. They were going, is this a test or something? Long story short, after a week of this completely unexplainable uh, psychic phenomena, take it off like a rocket and me not knowing why or where it was leading to or how to turn it off or whatever, I was scared. I got scared to the point I was pacing down Guadalupe Street here in Austin, Texas. And I have never been so scared and never felt so enlightened, but the scariness was starting to win out. <laughs> I was terrified. What's going on? I can't, people walk by, I hear every thought in their life. 
it's too much. After a week, it built up. Some point, and I'm praying and I'm crying. And of course, a lot of people around the street are looking at me like, what the hell is going on? Then the miracle happened. I felt immediately warm. I look up and there's this huge light above my head. My first thought is if I had a stepladder, I could walk up and touch it. It's five feet over my head. And I looked around and all these people who had been observing me, somewhat curious, watching me pray and cry and scream. And uh, they didn't even notice this light and I couldn't understand it. I looked up and the light had turned into a crystal table about that thick, not that thick, not that thick. And the, there were seven beams, seven beings with their hands on the table and the light was coming back through their hands, reflecting on me. And all of a sudden I realized that they were the monitors. I said, you're the monitors. Yes, we are. And they said, do you trust us? And I said, yeah, but I don't know what's going on, man. I'm sitting on, do you trust us? A couple more questions. A couple more, do you trust us? And within a second or two, I was hit head on by a speeding car. I was outside my body instantly watching my own body getting tumbled over by the car. I started expanding outward like a balloon, not like an arrow going in one direction, but actually like a balloon. I saw the whole earth from 360, north, south pole, all around it, because everything was collapsing within me. And then my body's down on Guadalupe Street in Austin, Texas. And people are screaming and hollering, but I'd completely forgotten about that by this point. I started expanding and going through the, the planets and galaxies, and then I went through the edge of the universe. And uh, this is the most I had no awareness of me anymore. That was completely gone. And this felt like it was going eternally, very quick, but very um, sequential and simultaneous, hard to explain. I went through this tunnel of light best description anybody's ever come up with and feel like I was kind of shot through it like a clown at a circus show or something. I was shot into this beautiful blue sky, infinite mind, infinite creativity, infinite love. And I wasn't observing it. I was part of it. And I could see that everything that ever was created, ever will be, was created by this infinite mind. Every man was stationed, every galaxy, every quark, Every, there's nothing but infinite mind and everything manifested or non-manifested was still just in thought in infinite mind. So everything's manifested or nothing. An infinite mind had two choices, be infinite, infinitely creative or nothing. And there wouldn't be any conversation going on now, period. There'd be nothing. There's no in between. It's infinite creativity or nothing. All of a sudden, I feel like I'm observing this. And I'm being pulled back by a term I use in my book I call spiritual gravity. I still had no idea who I was or where I was going, but I was leaving this nice space. I was pulled back through this tunnel light. I was pulled back into time and space. I was pulled back into this universe. I was attracted toward this galaxy. And as closer I got to this galaxy, I started seeing these flashcards. And the flashcards I saw are what's been going on for the last 40 years. I saw 9-11, I saw the Mississippi flooding, I saw protests, I saw economic things, I saw political things, I saw global warming, uh, and I didn't know these things until they'd happen later, and I'd go, wow, that, I saw that, like 9-11, I was playing on a cruise ship in Europe, uh, a Swedish guy said, I think you've been hit by a terrorist attack, I ran down to the crew room, looked at the TV, saw that second plane go through, people in blue uniforms all around me. I saw that picture 24 years earlier. So, and after I saw all these pictures coming back into my body in 77, I saw these pictures of myself, a musician and so forth. And then I saw my body <laughs> and people screaming. And this guy with red hair, the driver just shaking me, terrified. Well, I jumped back into my body. Now I just been to heaven and back. But this guy just hit me in his car and he was scared to death. Well, I was not. I was completely shocked. I'd just been to heaven. I jumped to my feet. I didn't feel any pain. I was not hurt. The whole car's towed in. The windshield scratched. People are screaming and hollering. And I'm just going, wow, whatever happened? Where are the monitors now? What do we do next? I had no idea. Within no time, there was police and ambulance and cops and so forth. And I'm trying to explain what happened and why I wasn't hurt. That did not float. 
at all. I didn't care. I knew I'd just been through the most incredible miracle and see an infinite mind. And since that day in 1977, I've realized the power that all of us have. We're all connected to that infinite mind. But if we want to gain power and use it and put it into practical use, that's why we go through things in life, not to get a better seat in heaven, to make life better here now for ourselves and fellow human beings. Uh, if we want to practice that, we have to, if we want to develop that skill, we have to practice just like golf or typing, you know. So uh, since that day, I've realized the power of meditation, the power of infinite mind. I, too, am bipolar. I went through a lot of depression in my 20s, especially because as a musician, I had a crappy voice that made the whole challenge very, very difficult, you know. Uh, so I learned to be a goofy entertainer. You know, can't sing good, can play well, but I found my niche by quit worried about my voice and go, hey, I can make them laugh at me. Great. Pays the bills. Attitude. It's all attitude. It's all perspective. And I'm a profound believer in miracles. I live through one. I can't create them all at will, but I do a pretty good job by keeping myself sane, like all of us have to in this time of change, because we are going through this great awakening. I saw it 45 years ago, and it's going to go on for you know a generation or two. The whole humankind has to see its flaws individually and collectively before we can fix them. And we got a lot of them and we got to fix them. And that's the only way to get a better earth and a better world. I also, I wanted to show you all this. I'll put a link on here. This is a, a book about my near death experience called the second eternity. It's even got all the police records in the back here that verify everything I'm saying or as much as can be verified. I started giving readings in 1980 by a method called lithomancy. And I'll give you a 30 second explanation on that. It involves 16 stones, 10 planet stones, sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and Pluto, and six personal stones, love, life, luck, commitment, timing, and place. When I do it over the phone, which because of COVID, uh, I'm doing most now, um, I have the person say drop. I drop them onto a little table with a piece of leather about you know, 12 inches in diameter, 14 inches, real thin to define a circle. I drop them right in the circle. I read them like a clock going from 12 o'clock to three o'clock to six o'clock to nine o'clock over 12 weeks. I record the reading. Been doing that since 1980 when I learned that system from a lady named Alice Wall. who's one of the most great, greatest psychics I've ever known. And she helped me develop my skill. She explained to me a lot of things that I've gone through. I've asked her about past lives with about 25 or 30 different people I've been involved with. And every time she nails it because of what I'm going through now, I helped her with her car his whole life and her kids. And she always said, I, Gary, I can never pay you back. And I kept saying, Alice, all I want from you, if you will, is when you pass over, become my guide. And she passed over about eight years ago. And I feel her all the time. I feel her all the time. She's got nothing better to do than help me. And thank you, Alice. So that's kind of a little bit about my experience. That's the method I use to read stones. And um, basically, I wanted to say we're going through this big time of change. I wrote an article for the Austin Alchemist uh, called What's Happening and Why? And it's all about this period of change we're going through. It's becoming pretty evident to everybody. When I saw it in 77, it kind of scared me because it looked like one minute wow. left, Gary. Pardon me? One minute left. So uh, good to see you folks out tonight. I'll post some links about my books. Uh, thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Nicole. Stay empowered, folks. Have no fear because it doesn't help you. Wonderful, Gary. Thank you so much for so comically <laughs> sharing your incredible, incredible uh, experience there. I particularly love the term spiritual gravity. Nice. That's a, a, yeah, it's good to put words on these things that, yes, <laughs> we can't otherwise do. Lovely. Thank you. We'll be coming back around for some, uh, some questions. Any final words? You've still got a little moment. Stay empowered, folks. We're going through, like I said, a big change. It's all in your head. You get light here, there's light everywhere, or at least not quite complete darkness. Thank you so much, Gary.
Our next panellist is Ruth Rosso Clothier. I hope I said that right, Ruth. So Ruth is a multiple STE experiencer who had her first near-death experience at the age of 16 months um, due to radiation on her spine. And then as a 20-year-old pregnant uh, mama in a cardiologist's office, her heart stopped twice. And when she went over, she was encompassed in absolute love and given a choice of which I'm sure she will tell us about. Ruth is the author of Wisdom of the Heart, Book of Life Here and Beyond. She is a homeschooling mother of four and a grandmother of eight. Ruth, welcome along. Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to share with you, I'd like to say hello, thank you to everyone and hello. Um, I would like to share with you how my life has begun um, and went through some profound spiritual experiences, transformative experiences, and how sound came into my life. Um, I started, like they said, at 16 months old. I was I had a growth on my spine, and the decision was made to place radiation on it. And I went into the hospital with my mom, and she, um, you know, she was able to hold me through the process of what they did. But before I knew it, I was absolutely positively gone. And I was right back what I had known before I was born. It was so beautiful. I can't even explain it to anyone. To be only 16 months old and go over, I was in, encompassed with love, embrace, and I felt like it was absolute home. That's, what I, that's the way I felt. Well, before I knew it, they brought me back and I landed in my body. And I, luckily my mother was, help, thank God my mother was holding me because it was shocking, it hurt, and it was profoundly painful. And I, um, I've had six um, hospitalizations when I was a child. And each time I could go back to this spot and ask because I believed that creation was inside of me. And I always had that connection. And I would go into a hospital and I would ask for help and it would happen. And a lot of us say, how can that happen? When, when you're first born, you're totally connected to both planes of existence. You see it in the sparkles of people's eyes, the, oh, the little children's eyes. So that's why. So I'm going to go on to my second death experience, which was when I was seven months pregnant for my son. And um, I went to a cardiologist's office, routine cardiogram, because I had a heart history and laid down on the table. And before I knew it, I was gone. I had, um, like I said before, I had two, but I'm gonna explain one. The last one, my, all my hearing left, all my sight left. I knew nothing about death experiences and I'm talking to the doctor. My husband's in the waiting room and I'm, you know, I had no idea. And, and I could see that the electric cardiogram was flatlined and then the ambulance came in and um, they put me on a stretcher. And at that point I went over and when I went over, I went over and I got the experience of my brand new baby, the spirit of his, of his essence. And it was so absolutely gorgeous. We got to mingle for a, few, a little while. And then before I knew it, I was back up to what I had known when I was 16 months old. And I was told that I was going to go back. And I had two choices. And one was if I followed fear, because there would be a lot of fear in front of me, that I would go on a journey with heart history and doctors. If I just recited the word one love, one, one lo word love over and over and over again, and it left my heart open, I would see that I would transition in a different way. Well, before I knew it, I was back. My, card my gynecologist was there. He had taken the fetal heartbeat and he said, Ruth, I'm going to pull you over on your side. I put pillows in the back of you. He said, I don't want you to to roll over. He said, I know what happened. The baby rolled, my theory is the baby rolled over your main artery and cut it off. I've, there's five cardiologists that we determined that you're not going to do very well. So he said, I'm going to have a discussion. I'm going to give my opinion. They're going to give their opinions. And I think you'll be here for a while. So the next thing I knew, I was upstairs in ICU and the priest was called. You know why they're called. And um, I was rolled over all night long, every 15 minutes and the fetal heartbeat was taken. And I was in raging fear at times. Uh, I, I mean, I feel like crying when I talk about it. I was scared. And, um, and then I would do what I felt and what I sensed with the human heart. And I would just say the w one word love and everything would calm down, everything would relax. And I did that all night long. And then they were, had the operating ready 
room ready to take the baby and uh, they were going to do a C-section because they knew I was going to die. And so that next morning I woke up and I made it through the worst time, but there was tests for five days. I was in the hospital. Seven days, five days they took me off of IV. Seventh day I was released from the hospital. And two months later, I had the birth to the most beautiful little boy in the whole world. Perfectly fine, sparkly eyes. I was so excited. I can't even tell you what it meant to me. And his name is Scott, and I just love him. So then I had a transpersonal experience, which I did not, ex I did not expect. I had surrendered to what I had known as God, you know, a spirit, to lead me into a direction to be able to be halfway decent life. I had four children at the time. I dragged a leg. I was just into a wheelchair and the pain was excruciating. And I, I just asked, I said, show me. And I thought I was going to be a doctor. I really did. And so my son called me and he said, Ruth, he said, um, I'm, you know, he, not Ruth, mom, I'm going to come pick you up. So he came and picked me up. We went down to a potluck supper. We got into the car, put the girls in the car. And he said, would you sing with me Om Namah Shibaya? And I said, sure. I didn't know what Om Namah Shibaya meant. I didn't even know what it was. He said, I just went to the ashram in New York. And he said, I was singing this. And I met Guru Mai. Would you sing with me? I said, sure. So for 45 minutes, we sang going downtown. We had harmonics moving. We had movement moving. We were kind of changing the tunes. We were so excited and happy. And we got there and I went to go and get out of the car and a woman who had to regulate her legs when she got out of the car I stepped out of the car and I had no pain can you imagine a woman all these years umpteen years when severe pain I had no pain and I walked with a stride two and a half days that pain stayed and on that two and a half days I had a conversation with someone and it was stressful and my energy went down and all of a sudden, the pain started coming back. Well, that set me on a course to find out about sound because I realized that sound was the answer to my question. So what I say to everybody is make sure that you listen if you ask. And so, and it doesn't come the way you expect it. So after that, I, um, I had my third death experience. Um, but I'm going to explain, uh, let me back up for a minute because I went home, okay, and I did have that stressful situation. But when I sang, you have to understand that my heart opened. I couldn't carry a tune. I guess that's what I would say. I really didn't have a voice, but I know it worked. So I, um, so that's what led me into understanding the doorway to the heart and pure sound. So the next thing I want to tell you about is my third death experience, which was extremely profound. I, um, I had a UTI and I took an antibiotic and got a severe allergic reaction. And my head was exploding off my body. It was hurt so bad. And like all of us that have studied things, I thought I could fix it. So I lay down and said the word love and I sang a little bit and I, you know, centered my heart and before I knew it I was totally absolutely gone and as I raised out of my body there were these harmonics that I could hear this resonating frequency of sound and it just encompassed my body and it went out and then it went into the universe and it embraced the whole entire universe and then it came down and embraced the earth and these sounds were with me constantly. And as I was experiencing this filling the universe and coming back down again, I saw this light ahead of me and I realized it was what I had experienced two times and I went for it, I'll tell you. And the sounds continued and as I got to this space, it was very, very interesting because there were many beings there. There were many of all all expansion, expansive nature, some not. Um, a lot of people from all different religions were standing there. And the sounds were still going. It was so beautiful. And they explained to me that there would be a time on the earth when there would be a hard time. But during that hard time, we had the opportunity to be able to see this earth expand and for us to expand to whatever we decided we wanted to do. 
and and that it was going to be happen because the vibrational frequency of the polarities were going to open up and i went okay i mean sure why did you tell me you know that type of thing the other question i got asked is would you like to go back and do sound and i said absolutely positively so I came back and all I could hear were these harmonics that you just heard they were going over and over my head two weeks I ignored them and my husband Daniel said to me Ruth instead of ignoring them and trying to bury them why don't we just try to record it I said I don't have a voice I can't do this and it's it's so perhaps profound that when when you want to do something or you surrender okay and you ask okay I'll do it all right it came out and that is the first song to our first album which was keys of internal wisdom so i guess what i would say to you people ask me what does sound do for you ruth what has it done for you i would say that throughout my life and with hearing what i went through it bring brought me emotional balance it brought me an open heart it made to understand the light that can shine within our heart and i had hope i guess that's what it gave me because i didn't have any for a while so I guess I would say to you that sound to me opened up a corridor that I could sing and the vibration in me that was a live sound could come alive because we all hold it. We all hold pure sound. The only time it goes off tune is when we get into emotional, mental, physical, spiritual. So in balance. So I guess I am just really happy to share this with you because it's been kind of within me and I haven't had anywhere to say. So thank you, thank you so much. It's, um, and it's, I know that everybody feels that the earth is a little bit different right now, but I think a lot of us are hearing that we're gonna be okay and actually better than we've ever been. So that's my thing. These are some of our CDs. Um, it's not all of them, but it is most of them. Um, Keys of Internal Sound was our first one. And we have Crystal Bowls and Son Concert, Rapture of the Tusk of Peace, Om, Hum, and Lullaby of Love, and journey, will, journey, Our Journey is Awakening. And it's our newest one. And um, I don't know what time. And this is, our, this is our new book, and we changed the title. It's not Wisdom of the Heart, Book of Life anymore. It's an in infinite wisdom of the heart, Our Journey Awakens, with the sound of the resonating frequency. So... We were inspired to change it, and it had not gone on the market really fully yet, so we just we decided to change the cover. So I guess what I say to you is that I am here, I'm here, and I really, really, really thank you very, very much. And if anyone wants to hear any more of this story that can get longer, um, I'd be happy to share it with you. But please trust in yourself. That's what I have to say to you. Believe in your essence and that miracles can happen i have seen so many changes in my life and so many miracles and right now at 75 years old i can walk without a with a stride and i don't i don't drag a leg so miracles can happen and thank you so much ruth thank you so much for being the walking talking singing chanting miracle that you are um and you know living proof living proof of what is possible what is truly possible these stories are just so profound um people are asking for your contact details so perhaps in the chat you can put those links in as well and um, incredible story, Ruth. We will be getting to some questions at the end. Some have been popping through for you as well. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you also for the heavenly sounds that just kind of came well, on in. For a moment, I wondered if I was hearing things. <laughs> and then I thought, well, hopefully everyone else is having this too. <laughs> well, you, it, what's so funny is if you could have ever seen us when we tried to record this, it was hysterical. So um, our studios were not perfect by any means. And yet you've managed to bring the sound through. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you so much. Lovely. Next up on our panel, we have Claudia Watts Edge, um, who will be speaking on soul contracts and our pre-planned promises. So Claudia had a shared near-death experience in 1984 when she and her newborn baby died together. 
Her unusual NDE has taken over 25 years to surface and she has been called a modern day mystic who sits in front of a big moon, <laughs> a big full moon there. And, uh, and she has the ability to pull back the spiritual curtain. Claudia is author of the award-winning book series Gifts from the Edge and also uh, We Touched Heaven. Claudia, welcome. Hi there. Sorry, I'm going to start a timer here so because I can talk. <laughs> I'm a storyteller and I can talk, so warn me. Um, I am really excited to be here. Um, as was just explained, I, ha I died in 1984, quite a number of years ago. And where I went, it was a pretty horrific death. And where I went was a complete and total darkness. And I don't say that in a negative way. Um, it was absolutely perfect. It was all encompassing. It was conscious. It was loving. It was vast. It was, un, I want to say eons, but older than eons. It was per perfection. And I found myself wrapped within it uh, and cradled like a baby. And I, for the time that I was dead, um, it could have been earth minutes, 10 minutes. I, I, uh, I don't exactly know but I could have stayed there forever. It felt like I had been there forever. And, um, but that's an NDE experience. And when I came back, I, that's all that I had. All of the beautiful stories that I had read about of meeting grandma or going to a garden or visiting with Jesus was not mine to have. And I, there was a researcher that came into the hospital because all of this happened to me within um, no anesthesia. Uh, it was an intern. The baby was, was taken. Um, so I didn't even have an aspirin, no oxygen, not even a warm blanket. It was pioneer style and they called me pioneer woman. And so I was of interest um, because I had not had any drugs in my system when I died. And they, and they were the ones telling me when you died, you know, who did you see? What did you feel here? What not? And I, I did not have good answers. Um, in fact, the answer that I started to give about being in this wonderful darkness was I felt taken on in a negative content. And so I buried it. I kept it to myself. It was sacred and I, I didn't share it, but I continued studying. Um, I even volunteered hospice. I wanted to learn, uh, you know, the ins and outs of pass of our passing, our lives and, and going into the afterlife and, and the physicality of, of lending yourself to death, basically. Um, so, my studies didn't stop, but um, so in my searching, I started noticing um, what I call movie dreams. I was having very explicit dreams and I started to write them down. And I had journals and journals of most of them were what I call the sand dreams, the, the, um, that you wake up and they just fall aside and you don't remember them, but I really work to remember them and record them and look for meaning within them. And in this study, I was able to become lucid within my dreams with the help of what I eventually learned was my guide would show up in the corner of my dream in a ridiculous costume and would be doing some kind of wild um, actions, a whirling dervish or in a fairy costume or something where I, I would be like, what's going on up there? And eventually he started holding up billboards for me to, and, and one night he said, come with me. And I did. And where we ended up was what I have learned to, that I've called um, spirit school, where I am and it was a wonder to me if I was receiving um, memory of my near-death experience or 
or were these new experiences? And I started to ask about them. And basically, and they're so funny, they're so humorous on the other side. It was kind of like, does it matter? <laughs> you know, does it? And I went, well, I guess it doesn't. So when, when my spirit guy shows up in my dreams, I playfully go along. And all of the lessons that I have been given, um, they have a heading. Tonight's lesson, uh, this particular one that I'm speaking about tonight, is the progression of, of choices. And I was with a, uh, another soul was uh, next to me. We were entering a room that uh, I would, I would say it was a lot like the holodeck in uh, Star Trek kind of thing where the, where the situation is set up for, for especially for you to participate and learn and work through. And as we stood under, as we were entering the room, it was pointed and I looked at, at this arch and the words above the arch. And it, this room was called the room of choices. And I was entering with a soul friend or soul mate, a soul, someone from my soul group, um, that might ring a bell for a number of you who have um, studied um, someone that was in an equal level spiritually. And I don't mean that any of us are more special than any other being. We are just all on our own journeys of progression, of spiritual progression. And um, it's just easier to hang like like, 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 right? You know, we're with, we're with our tribe, so to speak, our soul. And this particular one next to me um, happened to be, at this point in time, I'll say it was my, is my son, Jesse, my, my son in this world, um, Jesse. Um, I had been slated to become his mother. And we had gone through many, many choices before entering this room um, as far as well, that particular choice of being his mother and setting the groundwork to bring him into this world. This, our birth here is not, uh, you know, just a happenstance, you know, it's very, very planned for our, uh, for our spiritual progression. And we have every choice in the matter. We are excited to serve, um, it's a, it's a volunteer to be able to, as pieces of God, to come to this world and be the physical of God to, uh, as the omnipotent, all-knowing, our, our creator, um, that we love so much, that he loves us so much, that would vol say, absolutely, I'll go down and, and starve, you know, all of the horrible things of this earth, and all of the wonderful things of this earth. It was created in absolute love for us. And it was an absolute grand um, scheme for us to be able to come and learn and experience, not <clears throat> necessarily tested, we're not here to prove that we can be perfect. We're here to experience. And we choose our settings of what we're thrown into, what situations, what country we live in, what language we speak. You know, are, are we going to be, uh, our, our body type, is it going to lend us to, um, you know, a malformation, disabilities, um, afflictions, and um all of those things are taken into account for, you know, and, 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 and I say that, and then I think, why would we choose that, right? Why, why would we choose? But we do, because that experience just brings us so much further along in, in, in walking in another's shoes, in, in the knowledge of empathy. And I mean, you know, how, how do you have empathy for someone unless you felt it, unless you've walked that walk, talked that talk. So as we were in this room, and I'm sorry, I'm losing track of time. Um, 
as we walked into the room together, we stood on a platform and there was a representation of three particular bodies. There were tables that had a sheet laid over them. And as we looked down and there was a beautiful medallion, metal heavy chain medallion with a large stone laying across that sheet. And as we could look at the medallion, the stone would light up and there would be a short clip of a, a you know, little movie clip of that particular um, DNA genetic mix of what that particular body would lend itself to look like. Now, we're not looking for looks, height, blue eyes, you know, all of those ego things, right? We're looking, you know, for where, what that vehicle, where that is going to take us, how can we use it um, in best service, right? So, as we're looking at the medallions, there were three colors. There was a green, a red, and a black medallion. And um, as I was, as we were looking at the last medallion, the black one, I could feel myself coming out of the uh, back into my body, kind of you know, back waking up. And I, all I remember as he was picking this particular stone, there was a, oh boy, we're in for a bumpy ride. <laughs> you know, this is going to be, this is going to be a hard one. But I also was filled with so much pride of his choice of the adversities that he was willing, that he raised his hand and said, I'll go do that, you know, and he, you know, and I appreciated Ruth's excitement for her son. That's, you know, he's, he is a, he is a joy. He, he walks through life's adversities with and smiles throughout. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of him. I'm proud of the son, but I'm also proud of that soulmate, my, my soulmate, um, my soul friend that, that made that choice. This is, how much more time do I have? <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't see my timer. Just so a couple of minutes there, A Claudia. couple of minutes, okay. As I was saying earlier, this is not a happenstance. We make contracts and I, what I would like to call the people in the room, the council, our elders, um, these choices are very important. Um, our free will trumps everything. Yes, we enter into contracts, we volunteer, um, things are set up, but everything has it can be adjusted. We can come down here and go, you know what, I really don't like that guy. I am not, I'm not going for that. <laughs> and, and can pull out and say, uh-uh, I, I, I don't want to do that. And adjustments are made. And I called them the life weavers, because that is their job on the other side, this intricate woven um, contract after contract, neighbors and school teachers and lo future lovers. This goes back generations, you know, of our grandparents and that who are brought together, uh, not just for say Jesse's life, but my life has, has to be woven in there too. What are my adversities? What do I want to accomplish in, the, in this particular go around? And so it's a heavy, big deal. And the life weavers, man, you know, hats off to what they create for us here. Um, but these dream experiences and programs like like what we're on right now and listening to these wonderful speakers, I've, I've, it's like a spiritual puzzle to me and every chance to bring a new puzzle piece in and for understanding of, because the other side is so, so immense. So there's not earth words, right? And so, you know, but to, but to have small pieces suddenly, and I, I put those all in my books, gifts from the edge, Lessons from the Edge, and uh, We Touched Heaven. Um, I couldn't believe that I found myself in a realm of writing books. It was not who I was, but I've been pushed and prodded, and um, gratefully so, and was even told that I was had courage enough 
to step upon the world stage. So here I am. And, you know, this is me with courage. Okay, guys. And um, I thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Claudia, thank you for stepping up, <laughs> stepping up and stepping out. Um, extraordinary. It's, uh, gosh, everyone just has such extraordinary stories. And the way you have been able to almost collect and collate so many different experiences and information. And of course, you have to bring them forward uh, in a way where other people can access them. So thank you for teaching others in the way that you do as well. Marvellous. So we'll move on to our final speaker and then we will open it for Q&A. So remember, if you have questions for um, all and any particular of our speakers, make sure to get them in the chat so we can try and get to them. Our final speaker is Russell E. Ricks, who will be talking to us about not being alone in this journey. Russell um, felt misunderstood as a young boy with an undiagnosed disability, and he pleaded to God through prayer to take him away, to take him to a place where he would feel safe and loved. What followed was a near-death-like experience that I'm sure he will be sharing with us. Russell is an award-winning visual artist, and I love this, Russell. You have a blended family of 14 children and 35-plus grandchildren. How did you even find the time to join us today? I don't know, but welcome <laughs> along. <laughs> They're all, um, uh, all our children are on their own, and they have their own families. That's why we have 36 grandchildren and one more on the way. So, uh, and actually, at the age of 60, my, my wish was to have the whole family together. Um, and that came true for two hours. Um, they came together and uh, that'll probably never happen again. But anyway, um, so yes, I had a spiritually transformative out of body near death like experience. Um, uh, when, and I learned from my experience that when we come into this world, um, we, we come with gifts and talents. And like Claudia said, um, perhaps we chose challenges that we would have. And perhaps I chose my challenge that I was blessed, uh, that, I, that, that I was given. And I guess I could say I was blessed with because I've uh, learned from it. I've grown from it. Anyway, um, when we come into this world, I learned that we're not alone. We come with a portion of God's light. That light became our compass. And when we tune into that light, that uh, compass can guide us back to our home. And it gives us, it, it is the means by which we have our transformative experiences. Now I have a, a three minute video clip I wanna share with you that summarizes my um, near death like experience. Um, so let me pull that up and then I'm gonna come back and explain um, why and how my experience was triggered. And then I have uh, some, some of my artwork I want to show you uh, the last minute. So let's go. When uh, I came into the light and was surrounded by that light, I found myself standing high on a mountaintop similar to where we're at now, surrounded by aspen trees. And everything was filled with light, but not light being shined on it as much as the light was coming from within. Then that's when I felt this touch on my right shoulder and I heard a voice that said, Russell, what's the matter? Why are you crying? And the voice was gentle. And yet it was like the rushing of a mighty wind or the rushing of waters. But yet at the same time, it was gentle and loving and filled with total acceptance. And I turned and there was this personage with white hair and a white beard. And as, a, as an eight year old child, my description of his eyes, his eyes appear to be on fire and yet they're not. You could see eternity in his eyes and, and he, he would look into your soul and, and read your soul and you felt complete acceptance and trust. And I just allowed it to happen. There was no fear. And this incredible love just flooded my soul. I had this, it was like downloading of knowledge being poured into my mind beyond scientific knowledge here. It was incredible. And I began to understand how the universe was made, 
by what power, how it was made, and all the whole, all the processes. I experienced it, not just gained this knowledge. I experienced it. That's why I say all your senses beyond beyond what you your five senses here. You just experience everything and 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 understand everything from all kinds of different dimensions. After I returned, uh, the abuse continued, um, but there was something that I had that I didn't have before. The Savior in His presence gave me a promise that He would always be there when I returned, that He would always be by my side no matter what, and that He would let me know from time to time that He was there. And for the first probably three or four months after that experience, that love that I felt in His presence <laughs> stayed with me 24-7. as I was readjusting back into this world. This is something that I have been pondering on for the last 50 years. What does it mean? And in, it seems like the last five years, the answers really started to come. I didn't know what was going to happen exactly, and it turned into this book. I feel that um, I have a story to tell that can help people, so that's why I wrote it. Well, what triggered my experience? Um, I was uh, born with a neurological disorder that I didn't know I had. And I found out uh, about 14 years ago through an MRI scan, I had difficulty in school um, socially, and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't connecting the dots like everyone else was. Um, they were so much further ahead advancing with communicating uh, than I was. I would try to make a friend and I would say something that offended them and it would backfire on me and I'd end up getting beat up or uh, um, if, if it wasn't physical abuse every day at school, it was um, emotional abuse. And first I want to say I was raised in a good loving home, but um, outside my home, this is what I experienced every day. And even into adulthood, I struggled with communicating. And when I would have to get a secondary job. I'm a self-employed artist, but when I'd have to get a secondary job, sometimes was, those jobs wouldn't last more than a few weeks. And um, I was frustrated until my MR scan explained it all. I was born with a com complete genesis of a corpus callosum. And what that means is simply is I was born without this important part of my brain. The corpus callosum sits between your left and right hemisphere. And it's its purpose is to provide an uh, information superhighway so information can travel from one hemisphere to the other in an instant. I was born without it. So you say, how do I function? I'm high functioning. That is because while my brain was still developing in the womb, it recognized the corpus callosum could not form. And so it went to work and tried to create random connections called prox bundles. And so I can function fairly normally with quirks. And the major symptom for me was severe social delay. And so after um, I was baptized in my face, I'm, I'm a Latter-day Saint. Some people know us as Mormon. That's our nickname, but we're Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was baptized uh, um, at the age of eight. And um, about a week or so later, I was pondering on what I felt, and I determined that what I felt was um, God or his spirit, his light. And uh, I tried talking my parents into not going back to school. My birthday's in July, and I knew I'd have to go to school in a few weeks. And they said I had to. It was the law. And I begged them to let me stay at home and play with my little brother, but they said, no, um, um, you don't have a choice. Um, do I only have five minutes left? Yes, correct. Ooh, I'm going to have to wrap. Well, I uh, got on my knees one night. and uh, I also remembered an experience I had when I was much younger. I um, saw people 
dressed in white, come into our room as our mother would sing to us nearly every day. Mom had a professionally trained high soprano voice, and she sang like an angel. And not only did people on immortality enjoy her beautiful voice, people from the other side of the veil came to hear her sing, and this went on for some period of time, maybe several months, and then I didn't see him anymore. So one night in prayer, I was reflecting, well, if, if what I felt at my baptism was God's light and what I experienced in my younger years, I was an infant, was um, angels from heaven, then God has to be real. So I got on the side of my bed one night and I said, Heavenly Father, please don't let me go through this experience at school again. I can't. I won't. So I'm begging you to either take this away somehow or take me away. And then I climbed in bed and cried myself to sleep. Or just, just before I cried myself to sleep, um, the room started to spin. And the next thing I knew, I was out of my body looking down at my body. And I was brought in. I, I, I saw a bright light above me. And that light was loving and enveloping and embracing. And I, I was pulled into that light and brought into a, a space in a, in a heavenly realm where I was in an aspen grove. And there um, I recognized that I was there. My prayer was answered, but I knew that I sensed that I would have to go back to my body soon. And so I wanted to explore, and I was just about to step. I was in a clearing, Aspen clearing. I was just about to step out of that clearing and um, into the thicket of the forest, and a voice said, stop. If you go any further, that's the point of no return. You'll have no choice but to go back to mortality. And I dropped right there and saw it. And then a moment later, I felt this touch on my right shoulder, and a voice, a gentle voice said, Russell, what's the matter? Why are you crying? And I turned and I saw this person who didn't white, as the video described. And he took me to a city of light where we sat down in um, one, of the, one of the buildings that was there. They, all the city, the city was gold. The pre streets were paved in gold, the wall around the city, the works. And he says, okay, Russell, let's talk about it. And I says, well, what, when it's my turn to come back, what if I'm not worthy? You know, what? What if I made so many mistakes? And the Savior reminded me of his atonement and that he loved me. And he said, all you have to do, Russell, be a good boy. I've taken care of that. Just be a good boy and I'll see you again. Just follow me and be a good boy. And then he said, I have one more promise that I'd like to make. He gave me, he gave me several promises, um, one of which was I would be connected to his spirit. And then he said, it's time for you to go back. Are you ready? And I said, yes. And he said, I have one last promise. I promise you that I'll be by your side and I will let you know from time to time that I'm there. And when I return for several weeks, several months after my experience, even though the abuse had continued to happen at school, the difference was I knew that God was with me and I knew that he loved me if nobody else did. And that has gotten me, I'm 64 now, and that has gotten me through so many difficult things throughout my life. And the Lord has always responded with messages to let me know that he was there, just as he has promised. And so um, that's my message for you today. And uh, it's hard for me to share, obviously. That's why. And if anyone would like to uh, get a copy of my book, um, Russell Ricks at yahoo.com. I'd be happy to send you a link. And if you want to hear my full story, I went through it rather quickly. Um, Christy Salisbury, uh, the host of Let's Talk Near Death, who was on this conference, she um, had me come on her show, oh, it's four or five years ago. And I shared my story. So, so connect with Let's Talk Near Death and you, um, you can hear more about what I have to say. All right. Thank you. It's been a wonderful experience. And uh, now, uh, turn the time back over to... Thank you, Russell. 
uh, um, the tears. I see others wiping <laughs> their eyes as well, Russell. I mean, such a story. Every time. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of those. It's one of those for sure. I just want to reach out and give that little boy that experienced everything such a big hug. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> so hard. much. I, I understand <laughs> that's fully. I'm a big boy too. It's not an easy <laughs> one to share. Thank you for that. <laughs> Wow. So um, my goodness, four incredible stories. What do we do with this short time that we have left? Um, we're going to dive into some questions. Thank you for sharing. Um, Russell, just so you know, Kirsty's with us and she she um, clicked in on that and people have been sharing your links as well. So that's all that's all in the chat there. Kirsty, you could also share the um, the link if you could perhaps to the particular episode with Russell. Um, so let's do it. We have some questions. We'll um, jump around a little bit and let's just try and uh, get through as many as we can. Um, Gary, let's just go back and start with you. I, I wanted to chime in with one and ask, what is the secret to your optimism and joyfulness? It's practice. It's experience. It's having gone through enough depression and having actually seen the light and going, that's why I want to go. But it really is practice. It's mentality. I mean, I can barely walk across the room. I got so much back problems from my neck to my feet. I'm tingling all day. But I always look at it as gratitude because it's there. I can't take medication anymore. Don't want to. I look at everything as what it can teach me in life, really. And because I do that, I gain a lot in life. We all go through crap. We all go through fear. We all go through doubt. And But, you know, when you learn to play the piano, everybody hits bad notes. When you learn to drive, you bump into the curb. The point is you don't have to keep bumping into the curb. You don't have to keep hitting bad notes. We can learn, but it takes practice and devotion. Yeah, I'm very optimistic. I'm, I'm not afraid of anything anymore. Seriously, nothing I'm afraid of. Uh, I went through such intense fear leaving my body, wondering what the hell was going on. And I went through such in profound enlightenment coming back with the answer. I feel eternally grateful. And so I inspire everybody. I encourage everybody. We can't change the past. You can't change anything up this second. Can't change your genes. Can't really change somebody else. But the thing you could always change is your perspective, how you look at things. And that's all because we only got one infinite moment. There's not really a past. Go grab it. There's not really a future. Go grab it. Nope. We only have the present. And if we look at the present, the past, and the potential future with open arms and what we can learn, we're going to get curveballs. Amen. But how else do you learn to bat? Period. If you never went through curveballs, you'd never learn to bat. I look at fear as the what, what you have to go through in order to put you on the road to learning fearlessness. I look at doubt as something that makes you seek certainty. And if you don't seek certainty, you probably won't find it. But if you do, don't be surprised if you find it. So my attitude has a lot to do with practical application of attitude all the time and meditation. Give yourself the right to cut your logical mind off for 10 minutes a damn day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's my two cents worth. Uh, and a valuable two cents at that. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, Ruth, there were uh, quite a few questions that popped in. I'll, I'll lump them together. It was, it was around both your book and the music. So one question kind of pulls them in all together nicely. Could you please talk a bit more about your book and how it combines music with words and what it has to offer someone who is spiritually seeking and looking for answers? All right. Um, I think I got you my, we have this thing up in front of you. Um, the book, the book is um, really an, a course. It's, it's, I guess it's an experiential life course guide. guide for you to open. And it's, it's been, we've been in putting it together for about seven and a half years right now. And it has all of the music that was shown and it has 18 meditations and it has um, four lead uh, meditations to understand music. All right, so which means each, each chapter you play music in the background. It's a complete musical book. And what we've been shown and people have experienced is if you play it in the background while you're reading, it's easier to absorb. 
we this was directly given by spirit and we didn't change one word not one word in the whole entire book they said put a period we put a period and if not we let the sentence run on so it's um it's a masterpiece and it has artwork that you color pictures it's geometrical designs that my husband did um we did all the music we recorded from anything from crystal bowls to harps to zither harps to flutes to drums to all kinds of shakers, I mean, you name it, it's all in there. It's upbeat, it's, it's what you heard with all harmonics. Um, and you learn to, you learned yourself to open yourself to that divine essence and, and actually the healing within you. It's not that I do healing for you, it's that you learn to be your own healer. And, um, and that they, they talk um, about the earth moving in high, higher in vibration. So which means you can integrate more of who you are in here and the body start healing. And I am, you know, definitely one of those people. So it's, um, it's just, it's magnificent. And what Daniel and I are going to do is we will post it on our website. We're going to give a free introduction for anyone that wants to come listen to the music all night, listen to a couple meditations and, and do whatever it is. It doesn't have any religion behind it but it holds whole spirituality of who we are. So whatever you believe in, you can keep on believing in that and do that. But this teaches you to be a conscious human being, quiet your mind and become alive and enjoy life. I guess that's what I would say. I spent so many years not enjoying life. I don't want to do that anymore. So it's that we see life through the view of our heart. And with these diversities that are happening right now, we can actually ha hold, I believe that sound can help the universe and it can help balance this planet. And if enough of, enough of us are doing some sound together, that we can make a difference. And I don't know if there's any other questions that want more than that, but... Um, that's, that's brilliant, Ruth. Your house must be a lot of fun. <laughs> it's wonderful. When we were recording, like I said, that those stories are hysterical. My husband's here right now and... He, you know, he would set up all the recording equipment and he's actually the one that plays the Native American flute. But we've gotten, so we had this play song and I just want to say this in its journey. We had this play song that we sang for years together and I would do a chant with it and he would play his flute and then I'd go back and play the harp and I'd do the chant. And then finally we decided to record it and it just blossomed. And I was harmonizing with his flute, actually could harmonize with the flute and stay with it. And it's just, it's just beautiful. So anyway, I think we're all blessed. I, and, I, and I understand that Russell has had hard times and I've had many. And um, I really send a lot of blessings and a lot of highs to you. Um, but it's, I don't know. It, thank you for your question. I don't know if you have any other one, but thank you. Nothing. Thank you. Well, there's okay. a quick, a brief follow up one with that. Um, and we'll just go to a second one because it's related. Um, so just briefly, Ruth, where did you get so much music? Like, where does it <laughs> that's come a from? Very, see, that's <laughs> a very good question. Because when I said they asked me when I went over, I would go to sleep and I would hear these sounds. You have to understand early on, I'd have to grab it right away because if I didn't, it would leave. So I'd wake Daniel up at three o'clock in the morning. We'd shut off all the heat in the house so it would be quiet and we'd be recording at two or three o'clock in the morning. And it's totally from spirit. It's totally, they are joyous over there. So all the upbeats, all the whatever, all came through from inspiration and was led. And they're beautiful. They're absolutely gorgeous. And I give thanks every day that I listen to them. So that's that's how we got them through. I. I guess you would say that I put it through from them. And I would hear a harp, and then I would wake up in the middle of the night with notes to tune this their harp with. And I'd get up at two o'clock in the morning with a light flashlight, and I'd be, you know, I'd be writing down the notes, and then I'd go back to sleep. And then I tune the harp, and then the words would come in. So it was that type of thing. It was just constant. Pick up a crystal bowl, and I had a song. So amazing. Married to a musician, I, I have a taste of what you're talking about, Ruth. Exciting time. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't for it that. wonderful? <laughs> it is wonderful. It's quite the adventure. <laughs> I know, because Daniel used to say, um, it's one o'clock in the morning. And yeah. I tell him, I saw how you drum your drum. Come on, let's go do this. And, you know, it was that type of thing. So, anyway, it Thank was exciting. You. Thank you, All Ruth. Right. We'll okay. move on with a question for Claudia now. Claudia, 
what are some examples of accomplishment goals that people make when they're choosing their lives contracts? Hmm. Accomplishment goals. Basically yes. coming here at all is quite an accomplishment. But as I listen to, um, well, first, abundance. Those who who seem to always have the money, the ability to do things. Um, you know, I had an experience at standing at my life review and seeing so many screens and every moment of your life being uh, that you can see the choices that you made. Um, and if you live in, a, in an abundance and you're not sharing that, you're going to feel some shame on the other side. It's not made for punishment or judgment, but you're going to have a lot of life setups to make particular choices that are going to either make you feel good as you're standing in front of those screens or take that little step back in eek. You know, I could have done better. I could have made a better choice. Um, and I want to add to that because I don't want it to sound like it's a, like it is in judgment. It is a learning experience. And, um, there is there isn't punishment assessed to your judge to that uh, particular screens, but the very first day yesterday, uh, it, it, the conference feels like it's gone on for days and days now, hasn't it? But the very first speaker, Betty Eady, um, I would say she put it best at, when she saw. Uh, she was able to step back and watch a, a soul that had chosen to become a lawyer. He knew he was slated to become a very good lawyer, whatnot, downtown, offices downtown. And he would walk past a drunk every day, someone laying on the street. Um, she called him a complete bum. You know, it was just like, but she was shown the magnificence of this soul laying on the sidewalk and the contract that he had made with his friends. They were best friends on the other side. And he knew if he was put in a situation of having this abundance and intelligence and the, and the ability to make money and, but have to walk past someone that needed that, um, that he could help, that was a consistent reminder every day that he went to lunch, that he was going to have to walk past this man laying on the sidewalk that if he used that experience and gave and helped, and that's exactly what he did. And Betty said that she was able to see the magnificence of both souls in that contract. So I would say, um, you know, we set up situations to, to, see what, to see what we're made of, I guess. Thank you, Claudia. And uh, boy, aren't we getting an opportunity to see what we're all made of mm. <laughs> in this round. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes left and I just want to make everyone aware of the flood of love and gratitude that is coming in um, for the speakers and for the conference as a whole and the organisers. And Russell, um, if, if we have, because we do have just a couple of minutes, you didn't get a chance to share some of your artworks and maybe this would be a brief moment um, to, to share a couple of those if, uh, if still available. So I realized that I didn't have time to sh share it, but if you'd, I put in the comments my uh, website address, but I, um, I could also show my last clip, just a few seconds, it shows my artwork if you'd like me to do that. Yeah, of course. All right, please. I'll put up right now. Now, this 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 first image was um, my attempt to try to paint that aspen grove, and then the rest are just aspens. I fell in love with aspens. The tree became a sacred symbol to me. Um, and now, thank you. Um, the next one is a Grand Canyon painting that's four feet by five feet that I painted. Now the next two slides, the first one shows a normal uh, MRI scan, and this is a corpus callosum, that white matter in the middle. This is kind of what my MRI scan looked like without the corpus callosum. And this is my book cover. So that was my last slide. Thank you, Russell. So, yep, you're welcome. Um, Beautiful. It's, uh, you can stop the screen share. It's always amazing to see the artworks that come through from people who have had 
such experiences. Right. Um, thank you to each of our panellists tonight, to Gary, to Ruth, to Claudia, to Russell, um, for sharing in the very brief time, well done, um, so potently um, your incredible stories from my heart to yours. Thank you on behalf of SAI. Thank you so much.